Hello and welcome back everybody to the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. This is episode 216. I'm Dan John. Each and every week I sit down here, I answer your questions as best I can. And uh, this is a question-driven podcast. So if you have a question, send them to us, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, it's nice. I haven't answered that question in a while. How do you ask a question to the podcast? So obviously people are starting to pay attention. I really appreciate that. And it's not really a big deal for me to retype anything, but it is nice to see people are watching the whole show straight through now. So our first question comes from Matt. Matt has a question uh, that I've kind of answered a few times recently, but it's a good question. So we'll come back to it. I've heard you mention on several occasions, forgive me if I misheard or misunderstood, where you think weighted dips and the squat portion of the Mass Made Simple program would be fairly effective. Yeah. Uh, uh, we talk about it in the book, Easy Strength and Effective. I think it's called Easy Hypertrophy or something like that in the book. Uh, you know, in this perfect world uh, or this, this strange world, we can only do two exercises for mass building. You know, I mean, I would say no question the back squats on that list, but I would put the weighted dip in there too. If you can handle it, if it doesn't give you the problems we've talked about so many times in the podcast, many adolescent boys tell me it hurts their sternum. And of course, most of the males I work with have bad shoulders. So it just exacerbates that shoulder pain. So, you know, your mileage may vary. If you can, the back squat program from Mass Made Simple plus the weighted dips might be pretty good. And again, when it comes to building mass, you've got to have some patience. And you got to work hard. And that's the hardest thing. Uh, there's a phrase that got tossed around a lot in the early 2000s called time under tension. And I always liked that phrase because it made sense to me about what you need for hypertrophy. You need to really hit the muscles for longer periods of time. Um, that's why you'll find like something as simple as isometrics will work for about six weeks. Uh, I find higher up back squ squats, you know, because of the load. They work for about six weeks, and then after that, we have to find something else. So there's always a narrow window on mass building um, with almost everything, actually. But with mass building especially, it needs to be done kind of by itself. Uh, you can't be getting ready for a triathlon and trying to build mass at the same time. Um, you don't want to run a marathon after a mass building program, I wouldn't imagine. And mass building is not going to be good for high jumpers or pole vaulters or probably you know, people who do any kind of body weight stuff. So just keep that in your head. Uh, I have my first child on the way, and I know that my time in the gym will be limited. What do you think of a program consisting of a couple of supersets of weighted chin-ups and dips, followed by the squat portion of Mass Made Simple program twice a week? I know you don't like modifying programs, but just trying to be very time conscious in these uh, upcoming busy months while still being able to uh, maintain strength and size. You know, uh, Matt, I think that's I think that's solid. Uh, I think you might be underestimating uh, a child. Uh, the nice thing about if, like, for example, if you have three kids and you have a fourth, a newborn, a newborn is pretty easy compared to a teenager and uh, a two-year-old. Uh, however, when it's your first child, it's a, it, they are a lot of work. There's a there's a learning curve for both of you, but I think it's a good program. Uh, I might err on the side of doing the, try this out for maybe a week or two. Just do something as simple as, yeah, maybe just three rounds of dips and chin-ups. And maybe just one or two sets of like 20 or 25 reps in the squat. Don't, just test it out a few times first. And, you know, it could be anywhere from, you know, if you're using uh, pounds, 95 pounds, 135 pounds. And just, you know, do those workouts, maybe a total of two weeks of that. So that'd be six workouts. So reasonable chin-up, reasonable dip workout, reasonable squat workout. Fold your arms and go, you know, is this repeatable? And then slide into your idea of two, two times a week. Now, if you just don't have the time to do that little short experiment, just do the four workouts. Do a, a Monday and Thursday, a Monday and Thursday of the supersetted dips and chins and the, the squats. But don't don't go all in at first until you give yourself a, a chance to measure. Remember, if you read Mass Made Simple, I often, I mean, most of the people I work with, I wish would not go right in the Mass Made Simple. There's a six-week squat program 
that I recommend for most people. And during that six week squat program, I really would love it if you would diet hard during those six weeks. Because I tell you something about Mass Made Simple. You get sick of eating food. Uh, that sounds odd. It, for those of you who have never tried to forcibly put on mass, eating the amount of food you need to eat is just, it's, it can be uncomfortable. Uh, it, it's the worst what was me statement I've ever made in my life. But it is really hard. Oh, poor young man, you're eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I feel for you. Okay, it's probably best not to tell people you're uncomfortable because no one wants to hear the fact that you're shoveling food down your throat all day. Uh, uh, good luck to you, Matt. And uh, really, best wish wishes on the, the, the new baby. That's awesome. We've got a question from Justin. Uh, Justin uh, has a little preamble about being new to the con uh, content of my uh, website and my uh, YouTube channel, but uh, he's a big fan of kettlebells. So his question is this, there seems to be a large disparity between my upper and lower body strength. Um, Justin and everybody else listening, it's often true that people have big, uh, in comparison to other people, differences. And truthfully, I, I try my best in Easy Strength, the book, the Omni book, and you get that at danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore where I talk about the push-pull hinge squat quadrant. So very often for some people, they might have their squat lagging behind, but they're a world-class deadlifter. So be careful when you look at what you consider disparities, because it could just be the way you're, you're knit together. Uh, you're, but, you know, your DNA, your life experiences, um, and maybe even some of your early training that you know got you ahead in certain other areas. Uh, I've built up to three sets of 10 front squats with double 24 kettlebells, but I'm struggling to get my double kettlebell strict overhead past five reps with 16K. I can only squeeze out one good rep with 20. How can I increase my strict overhead press? Well, the answer always on pressing is press and on squatting and squat. Is there any value in increasing the volume beyond five sets of five for the 16K three times per week, part of my current routine? Or performing, okay, let's talk about that before we start adding all this other stuff. You might just not be a good uh, overhead presser. So uh, you, I would play around with three things in this order. And you're already starting to hedge that way already. First, I always think people need to increase their volume when they want to get stronger and bigger. So increasing the volume is the simplest thing. That is the tradition. I mean, you go back to the books I have from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and it was always adding more reps. Uh, very often back in the day, by the way, they only did one set of an exercise uh, and the goal was always to do more reps with it. So the, the first thing you might want to consider with this 16, uh, I noticed that you're struggling to get past the five reps. So maybe that would be a, a fun place for us to start. Instead of doing five sets of five, um, you know, do a war, uh, like a set of five, a set of five. And that third set, you know, kind of go for it, see if you can get six or seven. And if you can't, well, we're going to have to go to a plan B on this. Uh, after that is heavier bells. And, you, and the next question you ask deals with that. So generally we go volume and then we go load intensity. And then from there we go to density, which is same amount of work, less time. And then from there, I like to repeat that. I like to go right back to volume after that. You know, ease things up. Don't don't chase the clock anymore, and uh, get more get more volume again. The second thing is good. Or performing push presses with the twenty k. I like that, but I think there's a better answer. I don't know what lighter bells you have, but even with the sixteen, there's two exercises. Uh, one's called the waiter press, and that's where you take the ball of the kettlebell and uh, keep the handle maybe over here, and you press it. But what's good about the waiter press first, and you'll even notice when I'm demonstrating with air, you'll notice I'm watching the bell. I'm watching the bell. I think there is an advantage in overhead pressing to watch the load. Um, a lot of my bench press friends who are good at it tell me that they do the same thing. They, especially to make the finish, if you watch it, it seems to help. Um, I've heard some voodoo about this, but really it just seems to work. So the waiter press, and then the other one is the bottoms up press. And that's where you hold the handle and then the horns go here and then the bell's on top. So any movement with your wrist makes the bell flop. 
When I see it, especially kettlebell certs, I, I'm a master instructor for the uh, Russian kettlebell certification, the RKC. When I, one of the things I see most common when people are bad at pressing is they don't keep the pillar here. Uh, you want to be, this needs to be, this here, <laughs> the arm shank, uh, the, the forearm, needs to be perpendicular to the floor as you lift. Now, obviously, I mean, there's going to be subtle, small changes, but I actually would wish you wouldn't do it. So one of the things you start to pick up on when people start doing the bottoms up press is that a lot of people try to press like this. And of course, the bell falls over and they quickly learn to keep everything locked in and tight at the start. And as they move into that J-ish or, you know, this the, the motion in a kettlebell press is a little bit out and up. Don't go out and up. It moves out and up at the same time in a, in a J fashion ish. I would like to see you try the waiter press and the bottoms up press first. Now, doing the push press is great, but you're going to have to have some kind of system for yourself to make sure you're not doing, you know, I mean, <laughs> it don't, don't help too much. Uh, one thing I find helpful when I teach the push press and the push jerk at first to people is I have them bring their heels together so that when they dip, it, with your heels together, it's real hard to, to lean forward as you dip uh, with the heels together. It's just a trick. It's not a long-term solution. But what's nice about that is you get just a little quarter, a little eighth of a squat, a quarter squat bend in your knees. You stay vertical and you pop it up. If you're going to do the push press, Justin, this is really important, up fast, down as slow as you can. And we say in our, our KC certs is that you want to kind of pretend you're doing a pull-up as you're bringing it down. You're doing a one-arm pull-up as you bring it down. So up fast, down slow, up fast, down slow. Um, and the other thing too, Justin, it could just be you're not you're not built to press. I have a few friends, uh, many of them make a living uh, bouncing balls uh, indoors. Uh, and they're just not very good pressers because they're their bodies are built for basketball, not pressing. So th there is some of that. There is some DNA in pressing and squatting. But uh, try these ideas and get back to me, okay? I'd really appreciate it that if you would, Justin. Thank you. Okay, got a question from Thomas. Uh, I'm facing a new challenge on my fitness journey. Uh, interesting. Uh, we're about to have another uh, newborn uh, story here. And we greatly appreciate your thoughts on the matter. For a bit more than a year now, I've been experiencing a constant lack of energy due to sleep deprivation. As the CEO of a startup and the father to a one-year-old, my days are filled with long working hours and disrupted sleep caused by full diapers and or a hungry baby. So the first question I would ask if I were you, Thomas, before we move on to this, is how many rabbits can you chase? I mean, you got a full-time pressure-filled career and you got a newborn, which is a lot of work. Uh, I will say this, uh, things get better. Uh, I say that a lot. Things get better with babies. Uh, as I as I famously told my friend Pat Flynn, they start very small and then they get much bigger. Uh, and I've discovered with my children that when they were small, there were a lot less trouble long-term than when they were uh, middle school. Uh, that's just me. But okay, how would you optimize training with low energy uh, low energy, I apologize, and time limitation. Is easy strength still the go-to option? If I can't manage it five days a week, should I switch to a three by eight program or something completely different? My goals, strength, general fitness, health. Either keep the level or improve a bit. Everything else is not realistic at the moment. You know, I would say maintenance for you would be a, a, an amazing thing. And that, folks, <laughs> and that, folks, is the point I'm trying to make here. When your life is crazy, uh, I, I used to have this little X I would draw. If you have the most boring life in the world, you need a training program that the you come in the instructor and says, "Today, there's the workout. Let's all get ready." You know this workout of the workout of the morning kind of thing, the womb, and you put this thing up. There's no there's no there's no connection to the last workout. There's no long term logical point of it. Um, if you're doing that, if your life is you know you get a you know, at 10.15, you have a 15-minute break that you have to be back at your desk at 10.30. Your lunch starts at noon and it ends at 12.59. Uh, 
Uh, you have an afternoon coffee break at 3.15 and you have to be back at your desk at 3.30 and you have to be out of the building. Uh, you, 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 at 4.59 you go and at five o'clock you can't get back in the building. If that's your routine and then you go home and you have, you know, everything's routine, you need a crazy training system. So if you have a boring life, crazy training is okay. If your life is crazy, you need boring training. So I actually like both options. Um, you said strength, general fitness, and health, which is why I really would recommend for you, and I, I don't, you didn't give me the option here, but I'm telling you anyway. This is why I like you to try the workout generator. Uh, the reason I like that, it's over at Dan John University, obviously, and you need to have a membership, and yeah, I'm sorry to say that, but the thing about the workout generator is, you know, you're going to do three sets of 12, three sets of 10, three sets of eight. You're going to do mobility between sets. You're going to do, and you can also, you can also adapt it so the exercise selection on the days you just don't have it, maybe you do like a wall push-up versus, you know, a 600-pound bench. Maybe you do a, an assisted squat versus front squats. And I think that's the key for when you're busy, busy, busy. I'm only going to tell you to work out three days a week. I'd love to see you use the workout generator. Uh, if you can't do that, which, you know, I don't know why. If you can't do that, uh, find a program where you're doing something as simple as, but I wouldn't just stick to three time, uh, three sets of eight. I would uh, probably play around with the reps a little bit. Uh, I like the idea I always have of, th you know, when, when you're just looking for a program, three sets of 12 for two weeks, three sets of 10 for two weeks, three sets of eight for two weeks. Uh, maybe have a, a deload week uh, after that, that'd be week seven and then repeat. And, uh, why you're, when you're getting that three sets of eight area, that's when you really want to go for it on set number three. And I'd love it if you just had a strict one minute rest all the time, but you know, you know, I, I know how things can be. So my first suggestion is the workout generator. Suggestion number two, three by 12, three by 10, three by eight for two weeks each, push, pull, hinge, squat, whatever you can do for loaded carries, get your mobility work in, or just do the package over uh, workout generator at Dan John U. And good luck with the, with the kids. It get, does get better. Uh, I didn't really, when Kelly was born, when she was one, I could still train. But when Lindsay came around and I had a three-year-old and one-year-old, those were a couple of years where I just, you know, you can only do what you can do. Uh, that's when I learned to train on the weekends more, which is kind of interesting. I became a weekend warrior. Uh, I've, I've shared that in other places where Saturday and Sunday I would train hard. And Wednesdays, I'd go into my little gym and just do one or two little exercises, a few sets, and, and, and hope for the best. So my rest days on Weekend Warrior were Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. I trained hard Saturday, I trained hard Saturday and Sunday, uh, and it worked. Uh, sometimes I would compete in Highland Games on Saturday and lift weights on Sunday and be sore uh, until the next weekend. So it works, but you have to adapt with children, okay? Thank you, and good luck to you. Ross asks a question. This question uh, pertains to goal and skill pairing. When it comes to training, most people who aren't trained athletes want to do everything at once. Yeah, I know that. I, I hear that all the time. Uh, the worst, the people who are in the worst condition, and it's just not my opinion, it's blood tests, it's what the skin doctor said, it's what the, you know, eh, they don't sleep, they, do, you know, everything wrong. Those are the ones who want to do 50 things. Um, they want to get stronger, add 10 pounds of muscle, drop 20 pounds of fat, uh, learn kickboxing, train for a marathon, and look good naked. In your experience, what are the most effective goals and skills to pair? Bulking with strength, agility with speed, it's interesting, endurance with fat loss. If someone doesn't have any physical limitations and they want them to improve their overall athletic ability, recognizing that everything cannot be trained at once, what skills and goals would you pair together for the most efficient program design? And how could you progress from one set of goals and skills to the other? Yeah, this is this is fun because, you know, if you read the Easy Strength Omni book, danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstar, you know, you'll go into this thing called the quadrants. And now the quadrants are my attempt to explain the impact of a strength coach. And frankly, in some cases, you know, sometimes, you know, the strength coach has no impact on the success of a team. It's rare, but you know, there are there are cases that can happen. So what I've discovered in my life, there are certain things. Now, that's why I like Easy Strength for Fat Loss, because what does Easy Strength for Fat Loss do? 
to me, it pairs the two things most people want, okay? So, or, or need. So we have a very simple strength workout. And, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll make it as simple as I can. Three sets of three in the press, three sets of three in a pole, three sets of three in a deadlift, a set of 10 in the ab wheel, uh, suitcase carry down and back, put the weights down and go for a nice um, half an hour, 45 minute walk. What those two things do, the, the pairing there is this. Uh, you're going to get your heart rate up into the, the your, those fat burning numbers. Weightlifting is great. It does raise your heart rate and it gets you into that zone. I hear it called zone two sometimes. I usually call it the Maffey tone numbers, Phil Maffey tone. Guy changed my life. So for me, strength training and walking zone two, you could also do it with bicycling. Uh, people told me they can do it with swimming. I don't know how you would stay in zone two. If you're a good swimmer, I guess you could, but for me, I flail. Uh, I did sprint triathlons in the mid eighties and, uh, I, uh, boy, that would just raise my heart rate for days. I don't, I don't know how swimmers can slow down. I don't know. Okay. So for me, I think the, the, the biggest pairing would be strength and walking. So strength and zone two, as we're calling it this week, or Maffey tone numbers. Uh, let's do that. Strength and Maffey tone cardio numbers. Those, those to me are, are great ones. Now, with fat loss, that's fat. I mean, there's your fat loss there. From there, some people want to move from continuing to lose fat while building muscle or sculpting muscle, which, by the way, is the best way. If you want to look good, the best way to look, to look good is to lose some body fat and add muscle. What's the two most difficult things I know for the human body to do, it seems to me? lose body fat and build muscle, but that's what most people want to do. Uh, I like what you're talking about here. There's some, this is some good ideas. For example, when it comes to something like, I want to Im improve my speed, you know, if you read Barry Ross's work, the speed, the sprint coach, you know, or even Charlie Francis, you'll notice that strength training, uh, it works complementary, not comple, but comple with an E with sprint work. And, uh, I think you can really, improve your throwing and your sprint work by taking um, by taking the weight room seriously. Not everything uh, connects well. Uh, that's why I'm still such a big fan of a year-long or decade-long approach to things. And what's nice about your question, Ross, I think you and I are saying the same thing. Uh, I've mentioned my friend Ted before, and Ted is doing uh, something I think is really a good idea. So in the fall, he's Olympic lifting, okay? Um, fall is a great time for discipline training programs. Um, you know, it's back to school and all that other stuff. Uh, so he's doing Olympic lifting. When winter comes around, he's going to slide into powerlifting. When the spring comes around, he's going to start focusing more on sprinting. And when the summer comes around, he's going to play. He's going to have some fun. He's going to do whatever he feels like. That's the kind of approach I think is best. So when you look at the pairing he's doing, so he's doing... Olympic lifting, which, by the way, works really well with walking. Power lifting, if you read Marty Gallagher, you'll find that heavy hands and rucking work well with power lifting. Sprinting, you don't really need too much complimentary work with sprinting, especially if you're doing repeat 400s. But uh, you'll find that easy strength complements sprinting really well. And then in the summer months, just go to an old school bodybuilding program, three sets of eight or whatever it is, and enjoy the fun. Uh, I think that's a great idea. So I know I didn't answer your question perfectly, but I would much prefer you looked at things either seasonally, cyclically, cyclically, or even a, a bigger picture where you do a year or two or three. Um, you know, I had a nice conversation with Brian that he reminded me about some things. And, and he said, if I, you know, if I wanted to be a master's, somebody wanted to be a master's track and field athlete, how many years would it take to be good? Well, um, it's going to take four to eight years to be good. So when you're trying to chase all these different things, you never give any of those things the time to get good at. But no matter what age you are, eight years from now is still going to be here in eight years. So if you decided, for example, that you wanted to add the get stronger, add 10 pounds of muscle, drop 20 pounds of fat, learn kickboxing, train for a marathon, look good naked... Uh, if you combined a few of those, uh, like I think 10 pounds of muscle, losing 10 pounds of, uh, pardon me, 
dropping 20 pounds of fat would make you look better naked. Uh, training for a marathon would, you know, probably partner up well with strength training if you're in your Percy Cerruti work. And adding 10 pounds of muscle, um, you know, you, you could probably factor those in either cyclically with a seasonal approach or cyclically with a yearly approach. But you just sometimes have to be patient. You, you can't do everything at once. The great Stephen Wright joke, you know, if I had everything, where would I put it? So good question. Thank you. I've got a question from Tobias and Tobias asks us, I would like to benefit my community by becoming a kettlebell coach and teaching my friends and family to use kettlebells. However, I'm afraid to make the necessary investment to become a good coach because I believe that the skill of coaching kettlebell movements will be rendered obsolete by advancements in artificial intelligence very soon. Is it worthwhile to learn to be a good coach when a holographic Dan John might be available in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I went on and I did that one AI program. I said, uh, give me a Dan John program. And it was just nonsense. It was, they, all they did was take a template out of a crappy, you know, personal trainer journal and, and, and throw it up. And it's going to be a while before there's going to be a virtual Dan John. This one's bad enough. I got you imagine more. I still think coaching, I still think teaching will be around forever. It's the thing, one thing AI can't do is be a mentor. Uh, there's that movie, the guy who played the bad guy in Gladiator, he has, he falls in love with, uh, his phone and, uh, it's a great show and I don't remember the name of it, but I really enjoyed it. The woman that's in Lost in Translation is the AI voice, but you know, even in that show, I think it shows, you know, she's in a relationship with 43 other guys or something like that. You know, the AI, I don't know why I'm telling you that, but it's important. I mean, cause it's important because mentors and by the way, a mentor, Telemachus, Telemachus' teacher, his name was Mentor. Mentor should always be capitalized. It's a, it's a person's name. And uh, a mentor, like I've had many in my life, and I've been very fortunate. And a few people have told me in the last few years that I mentor them. And it's, it's quite an honor. But there's something about a mentor that just can't be done in bites, B-Y-T-E-S. It's, and it's, it's, let me just tell you one quick story. I had to, when I was in junior college, uh, I, before I went off to Utah State, I could tell my dog, uh, Paint the Wonder Dog, was starting to, you know, he was starting to age. And when I came back from Utah State, he was, he was really struggling. He had that, uh, just before dogs, some dogs die, especially bird dogs, they're, they're, the, the back of their legs starts to, it's, it's a nervous condition, I guess. And he was dragging his legs and he couldn't control his bowels and he couldn't control his urine. And so I had to put paint to sleep. And I got to tell you, it's funny because, you know, this happened a long time ago and it still uh, breaks my heart. Um, and uh, so I went to the gym and Dick looked up and he said, what's going on? And I said, I had to put paint to sleep. And he just sat down and he started telling me about putting his dog to sleep. And then Eric Subert showed up. He looked and he said, what happened? And, and Dick said, Danny had to put paint down. And Eric sat down and went, and he just kind of just sat there. So we sat there probably, for, I'm going to say half an hour, 20 minutes, talking about great dogs and how wonderful dogs are. You'll notice I didn't mention front squats. I didn't mention Olympic lifts. I didn't mention, you know, protein before breakfast or after breakfast. The best coaching moment I think I've ever seen in my life was that with Dick Notmeyer. Um, Dick is still with us. You know, he's 95 now. And every time I call him, he still tells me, to, you know, to eat my protein and take my supplements and front squat. And, uh, but that to me is what a mentor, that's what a mentor can do. Um, I'm not a huge believer. There's a word called empathy and I, I, empathy is a great word, but I like the word compassion much better. Compassion literally comes from the root to suffer with. And one of the things uh, AI won't be able to truly do is suffer with you. Uh, if you read the the uh, journey to Emmaus, Luke twenty four, I always have used that as my teaching model. You know, you don't you don't talk to your athletes; you walk with your athletes. And the road to Emmaus is seven miles, and if you walk seven miles, it's a long walk. And um, so, for me, uh, Tobias, great question, but it's great coaches, great teachers, great mentors walk with you. They don't just tell you what to do. We have a question from Tanner. 
I'm 44 and I've lost 100 pounds and worked my way back to my first pull-ups in 20 years. Tanner, congratulations. That is, that is just wonderful. I think they're awesome for me, but when I do them, they make the inside of my elbow achy. Yeah, it's called middle age pull-up syndrome and you've got all the numbers in the wrong direction. You're 44, you lost 100 pounds and you're using pull-ups as a training method. So yeah, every about half the middle-aged men I know who are listening to this podcast are all going, oh yeah, you know, right on brother. You know, hi, I'm Dan and I have maps, you know, um, and a little painful. I've been doing neutral grip uh, pull-ups. I'm wondering if you had any suggestion for keeping the exercise in my workout or a better suggestion. Right now I'm doing four sets of one pull-up three or four times a week. Well, first off, Tanner, uh, congratulations on the weight loss. And uh, I gotta tell you, your four sets of one program is pretty good. I like that. I mean, I, and you're getting them done. The only problem is, you know, I can almost guarantee you're getting about here and you're stalling uh, sometimes and that's what causes that, that issue. And it doesn't get better. Um, you're gonna have to do, um, you're gonna to have to rest it, obviously. If, if it's hurting, hurting, you have to rest it. And I don't know of anything else that helps it. Um, I've had conversations with people from uh, from Winnipeg to Denver, Colorado. I can remember these stories clearly. Uh, we were in the South somewhere talking to somebody else. This is an issue and it doesn't cure itself. It, it, it needs full rest. A uh, couple things. First, I don't know if you do ab wheels, but ab wheels, the way I coach them, are very much like how I also coach the pull-up at the RKC certs. So it's uh, straight arms, and you think of an ab wheel as a as a as a pull. For for some of the people I work with, that saves their elbow issues. For some other things you can do, well, you might want to try. You might just want to try other variations. Um, I have had people tell me that they loop a towel over. Uh, the pull-up rack, and they hold the towel, and they do pull-ups with the towel. Maybe it might be a good idea to knot the bottoms of the towel or something like that, so your hands will be, be even be safer. Some people told me that because as you do a towel pull-up, your hands move enough so that it kind of frees that elbow, and the elbow has a chance to move out of the way. Um, I don't have many more. I loaned them out, but there's also those little grips that you could, uh, they almost, yeah, almost looks like a, a, a thick pen with loops on it that you can do pull-ups with. Those seem to be good for some people. And I even had people tell me that fat grip pull-ups, so a uh, thick bar, and you add those fat grips to it, seem to help the elbow. But honestly, I think if it's starting to hurt, you, you might want to consider rest, but I don't want you, I want you to keep doing what you're doing, but let's, for you, Let's have you consider the ab wheel. Maybe try that towel pull-up variation. If that, if you can, if you can do that, well, then good for us. Um, and then from there, let's maybe even just slide over to suspension trainer work. Um, T Y I uh, rows, single arm rows for a while, and j but just keep the momentum going on this fat loss. And congratulations to you. That is that's really good to hear. We have a question from Sam. This is probably one of the strangest questions you'll ever receive. I'm a huge fan of easy strength and especially the mental model and framework that's simple application of easy strength and your lifestyle recommendations like protein, vegetables, sauerkraut, etc. My question is how would you train to carry other humans for long periods of time or in extended intervals, like a military fireman carry but for hours with rest breaks? This concept struck me whilst watching Hacksaw Ridge with Desmond Doss carrying wounded soldiers to safety for hours through rough terrain, including rocks, large puddles, remote. Um, how would you build strength in this modality over time if you had months to prepare? Well, before I answer this question, about 12 or 13 years ago, uh, a really good friend of mine was killed in action. And uh, he, in, in an earlier deployment, he threw a buddy over his shoulder and he carried him uh, about 10 kilometers to safety. But my buddy who died, um, he had shrapnel and bullet wounds in his body. I'm not sure you can train the body to do that. And that's the mind. Uh, you know, uh, the person I'm thinking of, John, and many people know who I'm talking about. Um, you know, he, he had this mantra, I will never quit. I will never leave my buddies behind.
uh, in battle. He would never, it was a pretty impressive guy. I don't know if you can train to be that person. I, I'm, I'm, I'm honest with you. I, now, obviously, <laughs> uh, I have big sandbags here in my gym, you know, 150 pounders. And uh, we have a hill over here called Mount Olympus. It's probably a six to eight hour up and down. Uh, you know, do that once or twice and let me know what you think. Uh, but one of the things, you know, sometimes when it comes to these people like, uh, you know, Desmond Doss and, and John and some of the other people I, I know in my life, um, <laughs> this isn't a, this isn't a, you know, it's not a game, you know, they're, they're saving someone's life. And, um, you know, on the, when they finally get them to the hospital, it's people like my niece, Danielle, that would keep them alive. And, uh, you know, there's long-term issues with, with that kind of service. You know, it's very hard on you long-term, uh, you know, after, you know, after, after you get home. So, uh, obviously, okay, just to answer your question straight up, I would say, you know, sandbag carries, you know, over the shoulder, heavy, uh, obviously big, heavy farmer walks. And then, uh, but the thing, the key is you, you've got to have a reason to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I always tell people to read Cormac McCarty's book, The Road. And uh, when you when you read about the son and the father, I think you'll you'll have a sense of uh, why I'm not a big believer in survivalism. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, I wasn't a better answer. Uh, we have a lot of firemen in my inner circle. I work with firemen a lot. And uh, my advice to them always is doing a lot of sandbag carries and doing a lot of barbell complexes. So somewhere between barbell complexes and sandbag carries is going to be your answer. Thank you. We've got a, a long question from Matt. And okay, I'm a 29 year old soon to be father, which I'm ecstatic. And my only goal with my training now is longevity for the sake of my family. I like Peter Atia's concept of health span. I want to come back to that in a minute. Where I'm not, not only living longer, but I am physically active and capable for longer. I've got the teeth brushing and doctor physics down, but I'm wondering about my weight training. I wonder if it'd be wiser to focus on muscular strength or muscular endurance. From what I've heard you and Atia say, strength is correlated with longevity, and that's been, yeah, that's true. Uh, I've also heard you say that one should focus on getting as strong as possible, reasonably, before the age of 40. I've been get, having great success with the five by five program, focusing on hitting all the major movement patterns, and my numbers are going up steadily. That's, that's outstanding. However, with my goal being to keep up with my kids, throw them my back and help them move into and out of college dorms, do you think you're gonna focus on muscular endurance where I move my reps up to the 12 plus range and doing more functional movements with kettlebells rather than the more static types of movements I do with pure strength training would be better. I know you're not a fan of either or, so do you think I could have a routine where I do both? With my job at home setup, I'm able to work out for an hour every day and enjoy daily exercise. I'm thinking of having two days a week that are focused on pure strength, and the other days of the week, I'll do full body push, pull, squat, hinge, rotation, load of carry in the endurance range and more functional uh, ways. And that would be, for example, uh, dead cleaning and pressing kettlebells, stimulate lifting my child. Yeah, you, you, I don't think you need to do that. Okay, so first, Matt, it was interesting you mentioned Atia with Hellspam. Uh, he didn't invent that. In fact, it, it bothers me sometimes. I, I like the book, you know, and I pulled it up. Well, it's right here. Uh, you know, here's, here's, here's Outlive, his new book. Um, one of the things about Atia and so many other people have been writing books for the past few years, um, a lot of them, they're, they're getting into that quote circle. Uh, they, they quote people they know who quote people they know who quote the author of the book, you know. Uh, we used to talk about that as being uh, circular reasoning or something. Um, the first time I ever encountered the concept of health span was from Heidinger's book, The Physiology of Strength, published in English in 1962, I think it was, from German studies in the 40s and 50s. And it's very clear that the word health span comes from that. And... Uh, I'm always amazed that people don't ever reference Tom DeLorme's work or uh, Theodore Heidinger's work. I, I, I'm shocked. Tom DeLorme gives us a concept of progressive resistance exercise. And honestly, outside of Brian Mann, who's down at Texas Tech, I think, 
very few people reference him, even though it's Tom DeLorme who gave us the concept of sets and reps as we see them today. Uh, the, the three sets of eight workout, three, you know, uh, and of course, Brian's brilliant insight on picking that up again and then, and, and then adopting it for modern training, which I loved. Um, so this idea of health span has been around a long time. Uh, if you haven't ever read that book, The Physiology of Strength, you really should because it it op- I mean, it explains so much to me as a, as a throws coach why my female throwers struggle with certain things in the beginning versus my male throwers. Uh, it's just the way the, 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 the bodies work. It also explains to me why retiring is often the smartest thing an elite athlete can do. Uh, there's massive chapters on that. Uh, stopping training completely. Uh, it takes you five years to get to a certain strength level. If you quit completely, it'll take you five months to get back to that. If you quit completely, it seems like it takes five weeks to get back to that. Quit completely, it seems like it takes five days to get back for that. So the longer you're in sport, the easier it is to get back to where you were. Of course, the issue always is, you know, moving beyond that. You know, I do, I do like your your little idea here on a training program. Um, you know, again, I feel like I'm being drawn to talk more and more about Peter Atia's book, which I did like. And as I mentioned in another podcast, I really did like the last chapter on emotions, uh, the information he gives us about having that little continuous glucose monitor thing. I, just, I mean, all you got to do is read the American Diabetes Association materials from the 1970s. You'll get the same in the 80s. You'll get the same information. Uh, uh, yes, you should exercise. Yeah, okay. Um When I, when I looked at what you're going to do, you got that hour a day to train. I First off, hats off to you. I mean, because having an hour to train uh, is is pretty good. Um, I like this idea that you have uh, where two days a week are strength built, uh, are just strength focused. One of the things we found on our inner circle is that most people do best on two or three days a week of lifting. And for me, when I say that, that would be, uh, I lift and then I go for a walk. When I say lifting, okay. But for most people, three days a week is just about perfect. In your case, you want to do two. I, I think that's just fine too. Now on those other days, yeah. Uh, for example, every Thursday I do my tonic workout, which is basically uh, what uh, an hour of me rolling around doing original strength and some flexibility work and. Uh, stretching my, you know, ankles, feet, hands, and wrists, and, you know, it's it's great. Uh, Tuesdays is my heavy, hard, long ruck day, which is great. Uh, I think you're heading in the same direction. I like that. If you can, I would like to see you, if you're going to do that strength workout two days a week, make it a strength workout. And if, uh, if I, yeah, if you're going to do five by five, do it that day. And then on the other days, you're going to train. Uh, don't get too addicted to the numbers. Now, if you're going to do, like you mentioned, the kettlebells, kettlebells naturally move you into that. I guess there are some kettlebell exercises you might only do a, a couple of reps with, but most of the time, snatches, swings, cleans, even presses and the double kettlebell front squat and gobble squats, they all kind of push you to higher reps anyway. So if you just did a traditional uh, heart style kettlebell workout, uh, I have a book called The Heart Style Kettlebell Challenge. You could probably use those workouts. Anything like, for example, the two days a week in the strength worm, and then maybe you can do my uh, armor building complex one day. You could do the single armor, a single kettlebell armor building complex. Um, and then the other day, you can just play around with mobility, flexibility, original strength, and even some of the weird exercises you feel like doing. Uh, I really like what you said here. I think it's a great idea. The thing I'm most amazed at is that you have an hour a day to train at home. Uh, uh, I have that too. Honestly, I don't meet many people who have that much time. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Matt. That was a very fun question. And uh, good luck to you. Uh, it's interesting, uh, gentle listener, uh, is that you'll notice we had that we had three dads of children uh, uh, email um, the questions in this week. Uh, I like that. It it makes me feel like we're we're moving in a good direction. I, of course, obviously, I'm still coaching. In fact, I'm I'm gonna rush out right after this and go coach my throwers. But it, it is funny to think that uh, 
you know, it, it was not funny. It, it makes me, it makes me happy when I get questions from people whose life situations are changing for good reasons. And that makes me happy. Well, there you go, folks. Um, another edition down. Uh, again, if you have questions, email them to the podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. This is a question driven podcast. So, uh, I do my best each and every week to answer those. And well, until next time, let's all keep lifting and learning. Thank you.